Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Helena College, Holy Cross, Greek Orthodox School of Theology. My name is Jim Skedros. I serve here as Dean of Holy Cross School of Theology, and it's my pleasure to welcome you this morning and to open the conference officially. We're really honored that this conference is being held here, that this conference reflects a connection between what we do in our classroom, in our, among our faculties, and our alum, and in particular, our female graduates. St. Catherine's Vision is this unique organization of collaborative theologians, female theologians, and we have to underline female theologians here, because oftentimes female theologians don't get the voice that they need or deserve in the church, led by um, one of our own faculty members, uh, Dr. Kiyaki Fitzgerald, adjunct professor of theology here at Holy Cross, who, with her vision, um, has gathered graduates of Orthodox theological schools here in the United States, worked with them, encouraged them, given them an, a context and an environment in which to meet, to grow, to think, to contribute to the life of the church. And for that, we should all be very grateful. I know I am, I know our school is, and I know the church is and will continue to be. We're also extremely grateful and honored that His Eminence, Metropolitan Kalistos Ware, has come 12 months later for a second time to visit our campus and be part of this conference. Uh, he is a gracious gentleman. He is a renowned theologian, I need not tell you that. Um, but he is just a kind Christian man who, through his writings, most of us know him, um, but for lots of you in the room here have come to know him personally and recognize that his writings are not just words, um, but are reflective of who he is as a human being and as a Christian called to, to preach and teach and live the message of the gospel. So we're very grateful to have his eminence here with us. And most officially, my role is simply to welcome you on behalf of his eminence, Archbishop Demetrius, who is chairman of our board of trustees and Archbishop of the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese here in America on behalf of our president, Father Nicholas Trandafilou, and also on behalf of our president-elect, who is here with us today, Father Chris Metropolis, whom we will hear from in a minute. And we look forward to a wonderful conference. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dean Skedros, Your Eminence, Reverend Fathers, ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor to welcome you to the campus of Helena College Holy Cross. As the president-elect, Father Nick wanted me to extend to each of you his love and respect and appreciation for his many years of service here. Uh, these types of conferences are extremely important. They're extremely important and they're especially important here on this holy place, which we call the Holy Hill. Uh, I have called it the last castle. Uh, this is the place that we push back the tsunami of doubt within the world today that wants to tell us that God is irrelevant, divine compassion is irrelevant, the image of Christ in the personhood of Christ in each of us is also irrelevant. Uh, the Annunciation came through hearing, and today you will hear many things. But the key will be what will we do with what we hear? How will we put words into action? And if we do that, we will then accomplish what we're here to do. It is my privilege to introduce my classmate, Dr. Kireki Fitzgerald. She has been a shining light for many, many years. Let's welcome uh, Dr. Kireki Fitzgerald. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. It's a miracle we are here today. And I can't thank all of you enough being here with us. In addition to thanking you, we, St. Catherine's Vision, are also offering you a couple of thank you gifts in your package, a DVD with the highlights of our last year's conference, Divine Compassion and Women of the Church, 
whereas Eminence Metropolitan Kalistos also spoke last year as our keynote address, as well as highlights from the lectures of all the other speakers that uh, presented last year. And so those are in your packets as gifts. And also, as another gift, we have included a copy of uh, a document, St. Catherine's Vision, printed uh, toward the end of last year, our international call for the rejuvenation of the ministry of the ordained deaconess. And so that you can take home and study and pray about for God's will. And so to give you a little bit more of an update of why we are here and how we came to be here, St. Catherine's Vision is a pan-Orthodox international group of mostly women theologians and other servant lay leaders, and now a few ordained leaders who have been joining us in our in engaging a number of contemporary issues in the life of the church. We had started first reaching out to women theologians, women who've graduated Orthodox theological schools. That is still an outreach we intend to connect with as long as we are able, but to now extend our outreach to women and men who desire to serve the Lord. And so what has happened is in our conversations, we've discerned that the issue of divine compassion, the Elios of God, God's love that originates outside of time and space for us that began even before our own creation, and that's a little bit mind-blowing when you think about that, is something that the church has always rested in and that theologians and, and uh, leaders in, in our church appreciate as fundamental in anything that we do, even our desire for kinonia, first has to take place after the reception of the divine compassion, of God's elios, of God's love. And so by contemplating the importance of divine compassion, this has been leading us in St. Catherine's vision to take more and more steps to be of service. It's still open-ended. We don't have an agenda. We just show up and ask God to show us how we can be of service. Recently, our group discerned that we should begin our first public ministry. Up until recently, our work has been mostly educational, spiritual, cultivating conferences and retreats, being consultants to parishes and other educational institutions who wish to know more about the ministry of men and women and life of the church. We still desire to continue that and hopefully increase that. At the same time, being concerned only with the, let's say, abstract felt a little imbalanced for us. I was the last to sign on to this from the group to take a step and commit ourselves to cultivating a conversation on the issue of divine compassion and human trafficking. Later on, we will have a little bit of a synopsis after His Eminence speaks from one of our advisory board members, Presidenta Maria Drosos, who will give you an update on how come this is important for us and what this means for us as Orthodox Christians. But in the meantime, with no further ado, I wish to thank you again and let us continue with our program. Thank you. It is my privilege to introduce His Eminence uh, Metropolitan Kalistos Ware, born Timothy Ware in Bath, Somerset, England in 1934. He is an auxiliary bishop of the Ecumenical Patriarchate in Great Britain. Metropolitan Kalistos was educated at Westminster School, to which he had won a scholarship, and Magdalen College, Oxford, where he took a double first in classics as well as reading theology. 1958, at the age of 24, he embraced Orthodox Christianity. Since his retirement in 2001, Metropolitan Kalistos has continued to publish and to give lectures on Orthodox Christianity, traveling widely. Until recently, he was the chairman of the board of directors of the Institute for Orthodox Christian Studies in Cambridge. He is the chairman of the Group Friends of Orthodoxy on Iona. He is the chairman of the Anglican Orthodox Theological Dialogue, on and on and on. Metropolitan Kalistos truly is a legend, but he's a living legend. We talk about legend as people who have left us. This is a man who lives his legend. Please welcome him.
The fathers, ladies and gentlemen, friends. The phrase divine compassion can be understood in two ways, vertical and horizontal. In the vertical sense, we think of the compassion of God coming down from heaven to us. And then in the horizontal sense, we uh, reflect on the way in which, empowered by God's compassion, we are to show compassion towards one another. When I spoke last year to this group, I spoke primarily about the first sense, the love of God expressed in Jesus Christ, above all in his incarnation, in his death on the cross, his resurrection, his continuing presence in the church. So today I shall be concentrating more on the horizontal dimension. I've been asked to speak more particularly on the theme divine compassion and the restoration of the human icon. Let me begin with a passage from a 7th century writer, St. Isaac the Syrian. An elder was once asked, what is a compassionate heart? He replied, it is a heart on fire for the whole of creation, for humanity, for the birds, for the animals, for the demons, and for all that exists. At the recollection and at the sight of them, such a person's eyes overflow with tears owing to the vehemence of the compassion which grips his heart. As a result of his deep mercy, his heart shrinks and cannot bear to hear about or look on any injury or the slightest suffering of anything in creation. This is why he constantly offers up prayer full of tears, even for the irrational animals and for the enemies of truth, even for those who harm him, so that they may be protected and find mercy. He even prays for the reptiles, as a result of the great compassion which is poured out beyond measure after the likeness of God in his heart. We notice here how the compassion of which St. Isaac speaks is inclusive, all-embracing. It includes within its scope the whole of creation. First, it is a compassion for humanity in its entirety. Isaac is not selective, but he does not limit his vision only to human beings. Compassion extends to all of living creation. And again, it's not selective. Yes, we are to love the attractive animals, the birds, the squirrels. But we are also to feel compassion for the less attractive animals, the reptiles, the scorpions, the mosquitoes. <laughs> In the desert where St. Isaac was living, the reptiles were particularly offensive and venomous. Even, he says, we are to feel compassion for the demons. This is a rather surprising claim. I would say, unless you are of the same spiritual stature as St. Isaac, I do not recommend you to concern yourself too closely with the demonic world. It could be dangerous. 
I remember what many years ago asking the then Archbishop of Thyatira, Athenagoras Kokinakis, who was in the past Scholarchies here in Holy Cross. I said, surely the devil must be a very lonely and unhappy person. Shouldn't we pray for him? And Archbishop Aphidagoras replied, briefly but to the point, mind your own business. <laughs> Notice also that St. Isaac says that the compassion that wells up within our hearts is after the likeness of God. Human compassion is a direct reflection of what it is to be a person in the image and likeness of God. Without compassion, I am not truly human. I am subhuman. Without compassion, I am not a man, but, to use a phrase employed by C.S. Lewis, I am an unman. I take that phrase from his novel, Perilandra, also known as Voyage to Venus. I like to quote C.S. Lewis because I see him as an anonymous orthodox. <laughs> Let's explore this theme further. What is the connection between the human person in the icon of God and the quality of compassion. And to answer this, we need first to ask, what do we mean by the image and likeness of God in this context? Exploring this subject, at the outset, let us bear in mind, we humans are a mystery to ourselves. Who am I? What am I? The answer is not at all obvious. The limits of human personhood are extremely wide-ranging. They reach out of space into infinity out of time into eternity. As God is beyond our understanding, so also the human person in God's image is also beyond understanding. We Orthodox like to speak of apophatic theology, negative theology. But we need to counterbalance it by an apophatic anthropology. Sometimes people question me what is meant by these words apophatic and the corresponding word cataphatic. Well, apophatic is really just a rather grand word for negative and Cataphatic is a rather grand word for positive or affirmative. I like to illustrate this from a little booklet I have at home called Signs of the Times. This was the result of a competition fostered some years ago by the Times newspaper of London. People were invited to send in photographs of enigmatic or paradoxical notices. And so they got quite a number of such notices. From Wales, for example, a notice in a car park 
saying parking is limited to 60 minutes in each hour. <laughs> or another notice from the road in Africa saying elephants have right of way. <laughs> and uh, there was a notice also from a market which said sheep and cattle straight on, pigs turn left and there was a large arrow pointing right. <laughs> As the Times said, it was somewhat churlish of the authorities when pigs are taking the trouble to learn to read that they should then <laughs> bewilder them in their sense of direction. <laughs> well, let me give you two examples from that little book. First, an apophatic notice from Australia. This road does not lead either to Cairns or Townsville. But it wasn't said where it does lead. <laughs> and here is a cataphatic notice. You have a railway line and there's a box beside the railway line with a bell inside it. And the notice says, if the bell is ringing, Stop, look and listen, and do not cross the line. If the bell is not ringing, still stop, look and listen, in case the bell is not working. <laughs> so there you have all possibilities allowed for you. Now you'll notice from the example I gave from Australia, that a negative statement may in fact convey a positive message. If you know the geography of the district, the statement that the road doesn't lead to Cairns or Townsville may in fact give you some idea where it does lead. And that is exactly the nature of apophatic theology in our orthodox tradition. Through our negations about God, we obtain a certain insight, a vision of who God is beyond words, beyond language, beyond our imagination. Now, this mysterious, apophatic quality of human personhood extends more particularly to our understanding of what is meant by image and likeness. One of the fathers, St. Epiphanius of Salamis in the early 5th century wrote, it cannot be denied that all humans are in the image of God. But we do not inquire too curiously how they are in the image. And elsewhere he says, tradition holds that every human is in the image of God, but it does not define precisely in what this image is to be located. There's a story told about the great Victorian Thomas Carlyle Returning from church one Sunday morning, he said to his mother, I cannot think why they preach such long sermons. If I was a minister, I would go up into the pulpit and say no more than this. Good people, you know what you should do. Now go and do it. I, Thomas, said his mother, and would you tell them how? Exactly, Epiphanius would not have satisfied Carlyle's mother because Epiphanius does not tell us how we are in God's image. Can you and I do better? This morning, I'd like to distinguish two senses of being in the image. 
It may mean, first, in the image of Christ. Or secondly, it may mean in the image of the Trinity. Let's look at those two senses. Yes, first, the image of God may mean the image of Christ, the Son of God, the Logos, the Word or Reason of God. As Christ is Logos, so we humans in God's image are logiki, endowed with reason, self-awareness, the power of organized thinking, and of coherent speech. We reflect, we make decisions, we have a conscience, a sense of right and wrong. All of this is included in the divine image. And I would like to note four particular implications of all this. When I was first ordained a uh, priest, I asked the ordaining bishop, Athenagoras Kokinakis, whom I've already mentioned, how to exercise my future ministry. And he said, always have three points in your sermon, not less and not more. Well, this morning I'm going to disobey him and have four points. Actually, I think it's quite enough to have only one point in your sermon, and a great many sermons that we hear have no point at all. <laughs> so then, fourfold implication of the image. First, it denotes kingship. As it says in the Genesis story of creation, Genesis 1, 26, let us, that's God speaking, let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness. The word, therefore, humankind is Adam, which means not man in the sense of male, but human being. Let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over the wild animals, and over all the earth. Dominion. But dominion here most certainly does not signify domination. It does not mean arbitrary tyranny. It does not mean ruthless exploitation. The dominion which we humans have is to be according to the image and likeness of God. In our treatment of the environment, we are to express the love, the compassion, the gentleness of God himself. The human being then, living icon of the living God, is king of creation after the likeness of the divine king of the universe. Let us never forget this royal dignity that we humans possess. There's a word in Martin Buber's book, The Tales of the Jewish Hasidim, that often comes to my mind. Rabbi Shalomo asked, what is the worst thing that the evil one can achieve? And he answered, to make someone forget that he is the child of a king. That is what the evil one wishes to bring to pass, to make us forget our dignity, our meaning, our value, as being in the image of God the King. This is illustrated 
in the ceremony of sensing, the offering of incense in our orthodox worship. The celebrant senses, first of all, the holy table and the icons in the iconostasis. But then he senses the members of the congregation. And as we are sensed, he bows to us and we bow back to him. In this ceremony of sensing accompanied by the mutual inclination of respect, we are acknowledging that we are each in the image of God. The celebrant senses us and bows to us because he sees in us the image of God the Creator. So then, first we are king, entrusted with dominion, with responsibility for the world around us. And then secondly, the image signifies freedom. As God is free, so the human person in God's image is free. God's freedom is absolute and unrestricted. Human freedom is relative and limited by heredity, upbringing, by outward circumstances. Yet there is a genuine analogy between the two levels of freedom. In the words of St. Maximus the Confessor, if the human being is created in the image of the loving and supra-essential Godhead, then since the Godhead is liberty, this signifies that the human being as God's image is also liberty. Equally it is said in the Macarian homilies, Heaven, sun, moon, and earth have no free will, but you are in the image and likeness of God. Because just as God is his own master and does whatever he wishes, so you also are your own master. And if you so choose, you can destroy yourself. Reflecting on the divine image, let us call to mind the words of Soren Kierkegaard. The most tremendous thing granted to human beings is choice, freedom. If we want some examples of freedom according to the divine image, we may look in the Old Testament at the figure of Abraham, the explorer, setting off from his home to the promised land, going out into the unknown with no idea of what his final destination will be. An example of courageous free choice. Or from the New Testament, we may think of the Mother of God at the Annunciation. God did not wish to become incarnate without the voluntary consent of the one who was chosen to be his mother. This is emphasized in particular by the 14th century Byzantine writer, St. Nicholas Cavasilas. The angel at the Annunciation waits for Mary's freely given response. He waits for her to say, here am I, behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me as you have said. She could have said no. 
And if she had said no, then the whole history of the world would have been different. I do not say that the Incarnation would not have taken place at all, but it would have taken place in a different way. The Holy Virgin at the Annunciation is not a passive instrument. She is called to play an active part. She is a creative participant in the event of the Incarnation. As St. Irenaeus insists, Mary cooperates with the economy. Yet freedom, while a precious gift from God, also demands a sacrifice, and it can even prove tragic. In the words of the Russian philosopher Nicholas Berdyaev, I always knew that freedom gives birth to suffering, while the refusal to be free diminishes suffering. Freedom is not easy, as its enemies and slanderers allege. Freedom is hard. It is a heavy burden. People often renounce freedom to ease their lot. This is illustrated in the parable that Dostoevsky includes in his master work, The Brothers Karamazov, the story of the Grand Inquisitor. In that story, Christ returns to earth in 16th century Spain and he begins to do exactly what he did in first century Palestine. He preaches the good news to the people. He heals the sick. He blesses the children. The Grand Inquisitor watches, watches with disapproval and he sends out his guards to arrest Christ and put him in prison. That evening the Grand Inquisitor comes to see Christ and he says, why have you returned? You came to make people free, but this freedom was too difficult for them, too painful. And we have taken away that freedom so that they may live their lives quietly, without anxiety, without pressure. We have, says the Grand Inquisitor, corrected your work. And Christ doesn't answer at all to the lengthy accusations of the Grand Inquisitor. The story ends by the Grand Inquisitor breaking down. He can't bear Christ's silence anymore, and he says to him, Go! He opens the door of the prison. Go! And don't come back! And all Christ does is to kiss him and go on his way. Well, the point of that story clearly is that freedom is difficult. And if you take freedom away from people, they may in fact live their lives with greater ease and less anxiety. Freedom is indeed a heavy burden. But as soon as we renounce our freedom, as soon as we refuse the cross of choice and conflict, we reject the divine image within us. We become less than human, unmen. And if we deny others their freedom, we dehumanize them. We cease to regard them as living persons in the image of God. It is precisely here that we discern the wickedness, 
the grievous and shocking sinfulness of all human trafficking, of all forms of sexual exploitation and abuse. We are treating human beings in such case not as subjects endowed with freedom, but as commodities to be manipulated as we wish. We are treating them not as persons in the image, but as objects. We lose all reverence in this way for the divine image, and so we lose all sense of relationship with the other. That is why human trafficking is so disgraceful. It is a denial of the value, the freedom of the person, a denial of the image. Then thirdly, Another aspect of the image of God, the Logos, creativity. The human person, says Athanasius, is a creator after the image of God, the creator. We are in the phrase of J.R.R. Tolkien, sub-creators. More specifically, the human animal is an animal that uses tools. We do not simply live in the world, but by virtue of our identity in the divine image and likeness, we reshape and alter the world. We endow it with new meaning. We give creation a voice. We render it articulate in praise of God. I reflected on this on one occasion when I was returning from France and I suddenly recalled that I hadn't bought a gift to give to my mother on returning home. So I rushed into a village shop and there I saw a bottle with a squirrel on the outside and as I like squirrels I thought I would buy this bottle. It was in fact a liqueur made from nuts. And I reflected, squirrels can do many things. They can plan for the future. They uh, will uh, assemble nuts, hide them away in special places for a winter supply. They will forget where they put their nuts <laughs> and they'll quarrel with other squirrels about whose uh, hoard of nuts this is. These are all very human qualities. But I reflected on one thing that squirrels don't do. They don't make a liqueur out of nuts. <laughs> Actually, the liqueur was very nasty. <laughs> I would rather have had the nuts in their natural state. And that illustrates an important aspect of the divine image. Yes, we are in the image of God. We are endowed with creative powers. We can transfigure, raise creation to a new level. But also, because of our human powers, we can disfigure creation as well as transfiguring it. We can poison the waters and pollute the air in a way that the animals don't do. Yes, it's true that animals do, to a limited degree, change the world around them. Beavers build dams, bees construct honeycombs, but they don't transform the environment to the extent and with the depth that we humans do, by virtue of the divine image. And this creativity in the divine image is exercised on many levels in scientific inquiry, in technology, in music, poetry, art, in, for example, the painting of icons. As St. Theodore the Studite says, because the human person is formed in the image and likeness of God, 
There is something divine about the act of painting an icon. Well, so far as reflections of the image of the Logos in the human person, I've mentioned, yes, kingship, freedom, and creativity. And now I come to a fourth quality, more important than these three. Formed according to the image of the God, endowed with self-awareness, endowed with God-awareness, we humans, consciously and by deliberate choice, are capable of offering the world back to God. So that's the fourth quality, authoring. Offering the world back to God in praise, doxology, thanksgiving. And in this thanksgiving, we become ourselves. The animals cannot do this. Curlews, cicadas, and frogs praise God in their own way, but not with conscious God awareness. Speaking of frogs, I recall my visits to the holy mountain of Athos, and there are large numbers of frogs there. Each hermitage has its own cistern for watering the garden, and each cistern has its own colony of frogs. And as the sun sets, you hear the frogs singing above you, around you, beside you. And I think the singing of frogs is a beautiful sound. There's a nice story told on Athos of an elder. And the frogs were making a great noise. And the monks were trying to pray their morning office. So the elder came out and he said, frogs, we've just finished the midnight office and we're just beginning matins. Would you mind keeping quiet? And the frogs replied, we've just finished matins and we're beginning the first hour. Would you mind keeping quiet? <laughs> so as the living icon of the living God, the human being is priest of the creation, grateful offering. That is an essential characteristic of our personhood. And here I'd like to quote from Dostoevsky again, this time from his notes from underground. Gentlemen, let us assume that man is not stupid. But if he isn't stupid, he is monstrously ungrateful all the same. He is phenomenally ungrateful. I often think that the best definition of man is a creature that has two legs and no sense of gratitude. And he goes on later, the anti-hero in the notes from underground, man alone can utter curses. It is his privilege and the thing that chiefly distinguishes him from the other animals. Now, all of this is very true. True of fallen human beings, of human beings turned away from God. But in the case of human beings as God originally intended them to be, of the human person redeemed in Christ, we are to reverse all that Dostoevsky says by 180 degrees, as he himself meant us to do. The best definition of man, of the human being, his chief characteristic, that which makes him to be himself, is gratitude, thanksgiving. What distinguishes the human from the other animals, what constitutes his privilege as priest of creation is the ability to bless God, to invoke God's blessing on other persons and things. This grateful offering 
we express above all in the supreme act of human worship, the Eucharist, the divine liturgy. The human animal, it has been said, is an animal that laughs and weeps, that has a sense of humor and a sense of tragedy. Very true, but we need to go further. The human animal, it is said, is a logical or political animal. Yes, but go further still. The human animal is a Eucharistic animal, an animal that fulfills herself or himself in the act of free and grateful offering of the creation back to God. And note that in the divine liturgy, we offer to God not grains of wheat, but bread, not bunches of grapes, but wine. We offer back to God the fruits of the earth, but we do not offer them back in their natural state. We offer them back transformed by human hands. In our liturgical offering, we express our iconic nature as sub-creators. We express our creativity. Now thus far, and at some length, we've examined what it means to be a human being in the image of Christ, the Logos. Now, somewhat more briefly, let us consider what it means to be a human being in the image of the Holy Trinity. And this will bring us back more specifically to the theme of compassion. The basic and primary meaning of our faith in a Trinitarian God is this. We Christians are not just monotheists, as are the people of the Old Testament, the Jews, as are the followers of the Prophet, the Muslims. Nor yet are we polytheists, but we discern in God both essential unity and true personal diversity. Our Christian God is not only personal, but interpersonal. Not only a unity, but a union. God is love, not self-love, the love of one turned inwards, exclusive, but the love of three, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, loving one another, each turn towards the other, each dwelling in and for the other. A love that is not exclusive, but inclusive. As the greatest living Orthodox theologian has said, Metropolitan John Zizioulas of Pergamum, the being of God is relational being. And he continues, Without the concept of communion, it is scarcely possible to speak about God at all. So there is within God, to use Martin Buber's terminology, a threefold relationship of I and thou. From all eternity, the Father, the first person of the Trinity, says to the second, Thou art my beloved Son. From all eternity, the second person replies to the first, Abba, Father, Abba, Father. From all eternity, the third person seals this loving interchange. Now, created in the divine Trinitarian image, we humans are called to reproduce on earth this divine interpersonal love. All that has been affirmed of God as Trinity is to be affirmed also on another level of the human being in God's Trinitarian image. God is love, not self-love, but mutual and shared love. So also is the human person. 
The being of God is relational being. So also is our human being. There is no true person unless there are at least two persons in communication with one another. Our human Trinitarian personhood is not egocentric but exocentric. Our human nature is social or it is nothing. So this is the fundamental meaning of the doctrine of the Trinity for our human nature. I need you in order to be myself. All of this makes clear the central value of compassion for any understanding of the human icon. Made in the image of God the Trinity, who is mutual love, it is only through compassion that we become truly human. Through our ability to suffer with and for others in loving and generous companionship. Visually, all this is expressed in the icon of the Holy Trinity by St. Andrew Rublov, surely well known to all of us. There, the Trinity is shown symbolically as the three angels who came to see Abraham under the Oak of Mamre. And in the icon, the three angels are not sitting in a row gazing out into space. They are turned towards one another. And in their mutual interface, we too are somehow included. The three are engaged in dialogue. And what is the subject of their conversation? They are saying to each other, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. They are speaking of the act of self-emptying, of compassionate love, whereby Christ Jesus died in sacrifice upon the cross. Rublev's trinity, then, is uh, supremely an icon of divine compassion. Of the divine compassion that is the inspiration of the whole program of Diachronima within St. Catherine's vision. Plato said, the beginning of truth is to feel a sense of wonder. Today, let us, you and I, renew our sense of wonder before the beauty of our human personhood. Our personhood that is created in the image of the Trinitarian God, our human personhood that is called to attain his divine likeness, through the exercise of compassion. A compassion that is both costly and luminous, both sacrificial and yet intensely joyful. Thank you. Presbytera know that everything that's done today will be broadcast uh, through the Orthodox Christian Network and we will share messages like this with the world. That's what we need to do more of. We'd like to open it for any questions uh, that you have. Go ahead, please. Your Eminence, you told about uh, an incident which happened several, a few decades ago, when you asked the noted theologian, uh, should we pray for the devil? And the theologian said, mind your own business. <laughs> well, now that you are an elder statesman and respected theologian around the world, how would you answer that question? Here we must surely be guided by the worshipping practice of the church. 
And in our tradition, neither in our public worship nor in our private prayers, uh, are we told to pray for the devil. We live within the economy brought about by Christ. Christ, the incarnation, did not become an angel. He became a human being. And therefore, what we know in Christ is the divine economy, the divine plan for the salvation of the human race. And we should limit our prayer and our concern to that. What plans God has for the reconciliation of the devil, we do not know. We have a hint of this in the beginning of the book of Job, where the evil one, the tempter, walks among the sons of God before God. And in the book of Job, he is, in his own way, fulfilling the divine purpose. That suggests that the devil may have his own relationship with God, about which we know nothing. What plans God has that is hidden in the divine providence. I do not believe that God could rest satisfied with the idea of a dualism in creation. Something seems to be unacceptable in the idea that in the beginning God created everything good, and even the devil is God's creation. And yet that at the end there will be a kind of division between good and evil. I believe that God has some wonderful plan which we do not understand for the reconciliation of all creation, including the devil, but we don't know about that. We know two things, God is love and human beings and all rational creation, whether human or not, is free. So God is love and God will not stop loving that which he has made. But we humans and other rational beings have freedom. It has been said by the Russian theologian Paul F. Dokimov that God can do anything except compel us to love him. Because love has to be free. It cannot be love if it is evoked under compulsion. So God waits for all creation to return freely to him. And to all eternity, we humans and the fallen angels have the power of saying no. But perhaps God has a plan of which we have no understanding at present. Recognizing the limits of our understanding, recognizing that we should be concerned with the salvation of the human race, we don't speculate about the devil. Leave that to God. St. Isaac says we should feel compassion for the demons. I don't think he actually says that we should pray for them. Earlier this week in North Carolina, there were nine people killed yes. in the church. The response of the victims' families has been forgiveness. <laughs> God have mercy on the soul of the person responsible. It's a very hard thing. This is a very hard thing. <clears throat> I feel that they are us and we are them, and I, but I'm still, it's, it's an overwhelming kind of occurrence. I'm wondering if um, Dr. Paulson can comment on this and just talk about what, what our response should be. When an outbreak happens, a senseless, cruel kid, it's a very natural to have the feelings of revenge, 
these people who have done this wicked thing must suffer for it. That's a very natural reaction and one can understand it. And if we have not ourselves suffered, we shouldn't be too ready to sit in judgment on those who have suffered. But at the same time, we know that this is directly contrary to the teaching of Christ. He says we are not to overcome evil with evil, we are to overcome evil with good. And he says we are not to return cursing with cursing, but we are to bless. So, the only way out of these tragic human situations is the way of forgiveness. As Gandhi said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth makes all the world blind. So, okay. retaliation, however understandable the desire to get our own back, is never a way out. And the only way of escape, the only way to freedom, according to the divine image, is through forgiveness. But forgiveness is most certainly not easy. Just as freedom is not easy, so neither is forgiveness. Forgiveness can be a heavy and hard cross. It may take us a long time be able to forgive. And it's easy if we are not personally involved to tell others to forgive. But when we are personally involved, we learn how hard forgiveness is. Yet forgiveness is the only way out from our human tragedies, and it is the way of Christ. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll move on with our program to speak about this initiative we're here for today is Presbyteria Maria Drosso. She is an advisory board member of the St. Catherine's Vision. She has served in various capacities for over 15 years at St. John the Compassionate Mission in Toronto, Ontario, Canada, as president of the board of directors and director of operations. Please welcome Presbyteria Maria. Your Eminence, Reverend Fathers, beloved Sister Presbyteris, brothers and sisters in Christ, I feel very unworthy to speak after His Eminence. But you know, it is very important that, thankfully, in such beautiful words, He helped prepare our hearts for what we wanted to talk about. And I would like to briefly talk about St. Catherine's new initiative, Divine Compassion, Human Trafficking. First of all, we need to define what is human trafficking. And I took a definition from a report from the United Nations Global Initiative to Fight Human Trafficking. And it formally defines trafficking as follows. Trafficking in persons shall mean the recruitment, transportation, harboring, or receipt of persons by means of the threat or use of force or other forms of coercion, of abduction, of fraud, of deception, of abuse of power, or of position of vulnerability, or of giving or receiving of payments or benefits to achieve the consent of a person having control over another person for the purpose of exploitation. That's painful. To give a little bit of statistics, between, and the range is between 22 to 27 million people worldwide are trafficked. And to kind of give a visualization of that, that's approximately the population of Australia. Human trafficking is generating estimated over $32 billion per year profits. But the victims are both male and female and of all socioeconomic backgrounds and in every country, even right here in our city here and all around the globe. Some how slippery a slope human trafficking is and some runaway groups estimate that one in three young people is, solic is solicited for sex within 48 hours of running away or being homeless in the US. Why are we bringing this up? It's the big elephant in the room and we find disturbing to hear, to talk about, or even to discuss, and even here and in our churches too. We might think, no, this doesn't happen in my neighborhood, it doesn't affect me. 
but the magnitude of this tragedy should not make us hesitant to help in some way. Sometimes when we hear these large facts and figures, it's just too daunting. So let's humanize this, and I wanted to share two stories of people. The Syrian refugee crisis has left hundreds of thousands of people desperate and vulnerable to human trafficking. Here's a newspaper quote from a Syrian woman named Amal who said, I left my family and my son in Syria. I met a man from Palestine who, bought, who brought me to Amman. In the first three months, he treated me well, but then he started forcing me to work in bars and in illegal activities. He made me sign a marriage certificate with certain conditions. My son is sick and I cannot go to see him because this man takes all the money I earn from work. The situation of my family is so miserable, I don't know what to do. I hope you can help me and find a solution for me. To give you an illustration locally in Toronto, uh, how trafficking hits close to home, a mother recently told me a story last week about her daughter, Helen. Recently, Helen and a group of four to five Greek Orthodox teenage girls were just hanging out at the food court in a suburban mall. A young man who was good looking approached them and complimented them on their beauty and was trying to persuade them to come to his agency for a modeling career. Thankfully, the girls were wise enough not to go with him, but he gave him his business card for his modeling agency and left. The girls went home, shared this information with their parents, did some research, and of course, they found the business was not legitimate, and it was the website on the business was a pornography website. Even above that, a few days later in the evening TV news, they recognized that the man who approached them was arrested and involved in a larger ring of human trafficking in the area. Why should we help? Victims of human trafficking, because they're the most vulnerable of God's children. As we had heard about now, we are called to share in God's divine compassion. And the opposite of divine compassion is human indifference. Not saying or doing anything is a tragedy to the, to the victims and their families. We need to uphold the value of the human person created in God's image and likeness. Today's society pulls us in the direction and the commodification of people and attempt to dehumanize. With this new initiative of St. Catherine's Vision, here are some of our big goals as well as smaller goals. Overall, for the Orthodox Church to be a beacon reflecting and expressing the light of divine compassion in the darkness of human trafficking globally and locally. And I like the image President Akiniki has brought up, to if we can just be even a small candle in this immense darkness. Some of the approaches we want to take for, again, our strategy attempt to do this is to collaborate with others already in this arena. In other words, not to duplicate efforts, but to enhance effective work being done to bring an orthodox perspective to divine compassion and human trafficking based on theological foundations and insights by divine compassion and prayer, encouraging theological and spiritual reflection on divine compassion and human trafficking, initiating an educational programming and future consultations, promoting ways in which groups of the church may respond. For example, currently, the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese in the United States, the Philoptohos has one of their five national initiatives is to deal with issues of human trafficking and see if they can help locally, as well as internationally in that measure, and we applaud them for that. We can also advocate locally and globally with our government officials. Some ideas on what we can do to take some small steps, and I'd like to read this, please. That we pray that our hearts grow in awareness and appreciation for the God-given personhood of every human being. That we acknowledge this sin against the dignity of children of God, both male and female. That we pray for the eyes of our hearts to be open to our sisters and brothers who suffer the pain and destruction as a result of human trafficking in our local area and around the world. Pray for victims who are suffering from physical, emotional, and spiritual violence. Pray for the perpetrators of the sin. Pray for those who choose to look the other way. Connect and engage with local and national international organizations that are helping with victims of human trafficking. Advocate for policies and laws that address the causes of human trafficking and protect survivors' rights. Educate people, communities, and parishes with, about the prevalence of human trafficking, again, lo locally and globally. Also, become a conscientious employer and consumer. And one last point is for each of us to consider individually and collectively how we can use our time, talents, and treasures to offer support to victims and to the survivors of human trafficking. We need your ongoing prayers and support as we, again, take this first step in this initiative. Also, a donation of your time as well as your talents. May our loving God 
and the Father of his infinite divine compassion guide our hearts, protect the millions of people who suffer, and as Emin has most beautifully said, let us not forget that we are all children of our King. Thank you. Thank you very much, Presbytera. Uh, Your Eminence, this has been uh, an incredible experience. Presbytera, thank you for organizing this and your entire group. There's a lot of compassion in the world today. So I don't want us to think that there is no compassion in the world. The problem is that many times our silence is deafening. We don't do anything. We don't say anything. I hope and pray that you will come to many more such gatherings that you will bring your families, your friends, your children. Let's rise, please, and we'll ask His Eminence to bless. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Holy Master, give the blessing. Christ our God, bless thy servants, for thou art holy, always, now, and forever, to the ages of ages. Amen.